Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Akola Gwek, and I'm the host of the show tonight. I take this opportunity to thank Town Meeting TV for hosting us tonight. Uh, tonight, we are going to have a discussion on South Sudan, specifically on the leaps, the leaps experience and professional experience of my colleague here, uh, Chengkwaj Mabil Majok. Uh, during this discussion, we will be talking about his professional experience having worked in South Sudan for 10 years, specifically in the oil sector. Uh, if my experience, my own educational experience is to be a guide, we look specifically at the ge geopolitics of energy and political economy of oil and mineral resources. And in this area, we have to look at how the oil economy has operated in South Sudan over the past uh, 16 or 15 years, and how the LEAPS experience or professional experience of Chiang Kai can inform us in understanding what the oil sector is. And so, without further ado, I will introduce my guest tonight. Chengkwanyi Mabil Majung Chengkwaj is the host tonight. Chengkwaj came to Burman in 2003, went to the University of Burman uh, in 2004, got a degree in economics, and also went again to graduate school at Brandeis University School of International Studies or International Business School and got a master's degree in economics. And then he went to South Sudan and worked as a consultant for Deloitte for a while and then transitioned into Nilepad and worked. Nilepad is South Sudan Public Oil Company and Chengkwach has been there for a while. And he has decided to come back to Burman and go to graduate school and get a PhD in economic so I will welcome you, Chiang Kwach, to the show. Uh, this is, how many days are you in Burma now? Few days, uh, less than a week. Yeah, four, four or five. <laughs> four or five days. So welcome back to Burma. Welcome to the University of Burma, and welcome to the studio year. So the floor is yours. Exactly, uh, I will have questions at the end, but the floor is yours to say whatever you want to say to Bromantes and our audience around the world. Well, Welcome. Uh, uh, thank you, Oko. It is obviously good to be back to Burman. Uh, this is a place that pick us up from the refugees camp. And uh, it has been a long way. We, we have you know, obviously grown. We, we, we came here as adults. We were, not, we, were, we were not teenagers at the time. But yeah, it has, it has been a journey, and Vermont has always been a home. You know, people here have made it home for us, and so wherever you have been, you know, especially someone like myself, you know, I left Vermont in 2012, and um, I, I went to Massachusetts for school. And then, uh, although I have come back a few times, you know, for a night or two, but then I have, you know, for, for the two years I was in Boston, I, I have gone back. And then uh, from Boston, you know, I, I got into the job market and uh, the next thing I know, I was in Africa, you know, which was my goal at the time. And uh, I spent the last few years in Africa, you know, mostly in South Sudan, you know, uh, a, a few times in East Africa, which, uh, which obviously was my goal. And um, it, it has been a great experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, if we could go into questions very quickly, is to ask you a question about the oil economy. Generally, you will be specific about South Sudan, South Sudan but generally speaking, right. having worked for an oil company, how does the oil sector operate generally from when the oil is taken from the ground to the market to when actually the money is received? Uh, th thank you, Akal. Uh, that is a very good question. Uh, oil sector, you know, obviously is very general, you know, because uh, there is the heavy oil, and then there is the gas part of it. 
and uh, for the area that I have worked in, you know, obviously was a natural, you know, national petroleum company. And uh, there are three parts to it. Uh, uh, oil sector, you know, obviously involved three areas, which is uh, the downstream and midstream, and then uh, the, the upstream. Now, if you break it down, downstream, you know, mostly deal with the supply of the final products to the market. And that is like, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, kind of bringing the final product to the gas stations like what we have here. Mm -hmm. That is mostly, you know, downstream is on distribution. Upstream, for the most part, you know, deal with, uh, with the sales, okay. uh, sales of the oil. And uh, it is... Uh, given the complications of uh, the, the, the global, global energy. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is one of those areas that is very political in nature. And, and then, of course, there is midstream. All right, midstream, you know, is where I, where, where I came from and where I have spent, you know, uh, a, a good number of my years. Uh, midstream mostly has experts that are helping, you know, making sure that the upstream and the downstream you know, function. And so in my case, I was, uh, you know, involved pretty much in finance and, and internal audit, you know, and that is making sure, you know, that the system is working, you know, that the kind of software that you will need are in place, you know, but what I could say is that uh, um, oil, you know, as a component is kind of, uh, it, is, uh, it, is, it is one of those products that can be good and can be bad, especially if not managed very well, and I don't think, you know, we, we have done a very good job managing our oil resources. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So, so in that regard, <coughs> oil has these three sectors, and you are in the midstream. Right. Yeah. What I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm, I have not been inside this area to be able, or any other, uh, right. Uh, uh, audience watching us tonight mm -hmm. is to say uh, when people say th for example when people are talking about ref you know pipeline right. for example mm -hmm. and there was the a row between Sudan and South Sudan and you know and the contract or the agreement that was signed and so forth the owner of the pipeline the owner of the oil how does that operate in terms, who, who, who gained, who wins, who had the power over <laughs> whom? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, thank you, Carl. You know, uh, when we went to school for economic, you know, there was always this common say, you know, that in a free market, you know, all players benefit, right? Yes. Uh, that is kind of true on the surface, but then deeply, especially when you go to the details of what goes in, into all that effort, in a way, someone has to benefit more than the other person. Mm -hmm. And so for our case, you know, for, for South Sudan, we are a landlocked country. Mm -hmm. And our complication, you know, became harder in the sense that with the oil sector, uh, we realized when we, when we became a country that there were some agreements that were done already. Mm -hmm. And so we, we became part of the agreement. It's like you are a country, but then there are some things, some red tape that you cannot... Uh, you cannot touch. You, you cannot touch, and mm -hmm. you cannot put your hands into it. And so what happened, you know, uh, somewhere, I think in the 1990s, you have a good number of oil companies, mostly from, uh, from Asia, that, uh, you know, that, 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 you know, that were, uh, you know, given rights, you know, to, um, to drill, especially in, you know, many parts of uh, the Great Upper Nile where you and I come from. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was the oil technically from the south, mm -hmm. it is being drilled in the south, and then it goes into the pipe, all right? And that pipe takes oil, you know, somewhere, you know, in, in South Sudan, especially in, uh, you know, what, what we now call the Upper Nile and, and uh, you know, parts of Unity State and mm -hmm. the ruling administrative area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that oil goes into the pipe and it goes all the way, you know, uh, to, to Khartoum, and then uh, from Khartoum now, it, that it has to go to port, all right, where, you know, the, the port is kind of where all these international, you know, uh, how do you call them? 
you know, uh, in, in our basic language, we, we could call them trucks. Trucks, or these cargoes. Those cargoes, exactly, that is the right word. You know, and so they would come and kind of pick it up from there. It, it goes into some of those silos or whatever Cargo. that you use to store the, the liquid. Mm -hmm. And then it will go into some of these, you know, so some of these waterways, and that is when it goes for sale. It can technically be sold when it is underground, you know, but for the most part, you know, for us, it was sold when it is still underground. Okay. All right. And uh, in Port Sudan, you know, you have uh, the refinery where the oil is kind of, you know, kind of separated now. That is the dirt and then the, the part of it which, uh, you know, which is kind of goes into water. And then you, you get the final product out of that. Now for us, it was tricky in the sand, you know, that while the oil is produced in the south, it has to somewhat go to Port Sudan, which is technically a different country, before the final product, you know, comes back to the market. And so in a sense, you could have a car in South Sudan and you are sitting on oil, but then there is no way you can get that oil and put it onto your tent. <laughs> Yeah, so it is, uh, it, it is, it is, it is, it, it, it has been a complicated process. Uh, some steps were taken by the government of South Sudan, you know, in a way, you know, to make sure that because the distance, you know, where the oil flows from South Sudan to North Sudan and to the port, Port Sudan, it's kind of a long distance. The shorter distance for us is through East Africa, especially through Mombasa. Uh, there were also some proposals that it could be done through Eritrea right both distances are short but then there were some challenges you know a lot of them political in nature you know and we were thinking that if the country was stable you know from 2011 uh to 2022 we feel like it, it would have been done but mm -hmm. because instability came in very three years into independent i, I, I kind of feel like uh, you know we did not give ourselves a chance to devolve our own resources so that we can benefit from it. And so to go back to your questions on who benefits, you know, from the fees and all that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the estimates, you know, obviously around 2012, you know, uh, or it could have been way before that. Mm -hmm. Sudan, you know, being the country that, you know, that, uh, that helped that South the Sudan pass through, mm -hmm. through and the pipelines are there mm -hmm. as well. You know, they kind of attach some of those minor pipes to the main pipes. So they so, actually steal the oil uh, as exactly. it flows. It was, it was being sipped off. <laughs> and uh, yeah, for the years that I have been there, I have tried my best to find whether we have anyone that was, you know, kind of monitoring, you know, the volume, especially the point of production, you know, to, to what arrive at port. To, to what arrive at the port. And, and there was nobody. I have not found anyone yet. <laughs> <laughs> now let's let's let me get back to this. Who who are the consumers of, of South Sudan oil? Uh, it is uh, all right. What uh, country actually buys South Sudan oil? It is it is it is buying of countries. All right. So not China as people think. Obviously, it is China. They they are the main beneficiaries. You know, in the sense that they have uh, what they call, you know, the the China. Like if you look at the kind of uh, the the operating companies, we have three main companies. You know, main operating companies, and uh, out of the three, China and Malaysia mm -hmm. are either the first or the second shareholders. You know, I don't have the percentages in mind, mm -hmm. but for the most part, you could you could call them the main beneficiaries. And of course, uh, the oil, you know, our oil for the most part sells to Middle East. Mm -hmm and some few countries in Asia, a uh, few in Eastern Europe. And nothing here in the U.S.? Uh, no, I, 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 don't, I, I don't have any data of anything that has ever come to America. No, none. That, none. that I could say with confidence. Okay, okay. Yeah. Now, so let's, let's, let's de let, let, let us pursue this. Mm -hmm. Of these three, there is downstream, midstream, and, and upstream. upstream right. You were in midstream. How close are you to oil money? <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's, I, would, uh, I, I would say, you know, what I was dealing with, especially at the internal auditor. 
You don't see the you money, know. you don't touch it. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I never came into the point of knowing, you know, as I said before, mm -hmm. I really didn't, I, I, I have never found anyone that was, you know, that was present at the point of production and knows exactly the daily vo you know, volume and can say what we have produced today is this much. All right, I, I, I did not find that person. I did not find anyone that was at the point of sales, all right, where the mm -hmm. final products was going onto some of these and ships. And you are the auditor. That is correct, all right. So, you know, sometimes that is the issue with working with the government because you, you realize there are a lot of red tips. Mm -hmm. And so if you try to get into it too much, you might find get yourself in trouble. In trouble. <laughs> 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 so that's that. What other things, you know, as I as you know, I have been in Juba a couple times right, and right, right. and people that work for the Nile Pet, mm -hmm. the petroleum company, are are well regarded and they are considered as probably doing well economically or doing well financially. Uh, so when you left that company and mm -hmm. returned to its school, somebody has to wonder if if you have given up a very lucrative job for education uh you know obviously what happened uh there is a lot of myth about uh, about nile pet obviously you know and there is some truth to that mm -hmm. the company was founded around 2005 all right and the goal was to have a national company that with time can you know can can become a uh, an operating company mm -hmm. but then the issue all along has been you know uh, that of uh, uh, it became in a sense political mm -hmm. all right uh, because you know for you to kind of have you know to have something a company that that kind of grows from nothing to a national company that becomes an operator and can explore and can be given concessions by the government, you, you need a steady leadership, leadership right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the CEOs, you know, it, it was some thought of, uh, you know, how do you call it? A, a slinging door, a door that opens and, and closes. Revolving door. A revolving door. You know, and so with the CEOs and, the, and with the senior leaderships kind of in and, in, 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 in in and out, out. Uh, you could see, you know, from the management point of view, that uh, this, in a sense, create instability. All right, because if you know, if if you don't have any contra contracts that will say, all right, we have given you this chance. Five years, for example. You, you will be here for four or five years, ten years. You know, and the, the next thing you know is you kind of walk your ways around, you know, to to become the CEO. And the same way you walk around of becoming the CEO, you can actually get out the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it it, it 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 kind of you know those who were you know lucky enough to be the managing directors mm -hmm. came in through politics. Mm -hmm. They got out through politics. So they are political appointees. That is correct. It is like you get in today and you are worried. You get another group that is trying to get you out tomorrow. Wow. And so in a sense, you know, uh, you 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 find managers who were very uncertain. And instead of doing their work, they were worried about, you know, the politics of it, mm -hmm. you know, trying to make sure, you know, there are loopholes. And if someone is talking bad about me, mm -hmm. you know, I should go out there and find a way of making sure that they talk about me, you know. <laughs> and so how, how do you make sure that someone doesn't talk about you? You know, obviously you cannot kill people. And so you, you find a way of using the sources to kind of bribe people so that they keep quiet. Oh, so wow. it, was, it, was, it was a trick here. You know, it has it has been a bit of tricky, you know, kind of situation, you know, and you know, obviously, you know, at this point we have uh, we have Dictor Shul, you know, he was uh, was kind of removed, came back, and I believe he's he's one qualified guy who has been doing a very good job, mm -hmm. and I feel like if he can be give, be given a contract, you know, that can make him work for three to seven years, I think I think I think he can do better, mm -hmm. but he's you know he obviously it's a worried man because the politics, you know, won't let him do exactly what he needs to do, especially on a daily basis. And so that I see is the impediment. Now coming back to your main, qu <coughs> main question, which was, 
you know, that people who have worked for NILPAD are generally well regarded. You know, uh, in the past, before the, the war of 2013, mm -hmm. uh, at, at NILPAD, people were paid decently, especially in dollars from 2005 to somewhere around 2014. Okay. All right. So uh, a manager, you know, a director like I was, you know, you 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 were getting a decent pay, you know, while the public, you know, what what is it? Uh, the 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 you know the government employees were getting paid in uh, South Sudanese pounds. And you were you know, paid dollar. You were paid in dollars. But then, if you look at our pay compared to you know the foreigners, they were getting paid at least ten times than us. And so that 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 was kind of you know bad because you are doing equal work you know pretty much the same you know same expertise and you could be much qualified you know than a foreigner who is working with you but then you realize they get paid 10 times and so that was demoralizing but then uh, 2013 war came in all right I got into it in I uh, got into Nile Pad in 2016 and uh, when I got in um, you know, we we were getting paid in pounds, and so and the, I, I kind of kind of went in when the wells were dry. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, the the currency is crashed. So we have Correct. less than ten minutes left. So mm -hmm. let's 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 mm -hmm. let's let us specify this. Mm -hmm. Let's get into the economics. Mm -hmm. You have been there in South Sudan in the oil sector, right. and. And, 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 and you have come back here to the University of Vermont to pursue a PhD in economics. There are, the, the data is there. All the countries that have oil right. have not, mostly have not been successful in using that resource to develop their economies and their countries. That data is there. Unless you are a Saudi Arabia that has a lot of money, mm -hmm. then you can use that money to, to buy social contract to buy support from people. Right. But if you don't have that much and you don't use that oil to develop your economy or your other sectors, uh, you end up in a situation like South Sudan or other places. Right. Data has it that only Botswana and Norway are the only two countries to date yeah. that have used their oil revenue to develop their other sectors, right. mostly by creating sovereign wealth fund that they then use to fund into other sectors. Based on your expertise, what do you think, mobbing, looking, mobbing forward, what, what are some of your ideas that, that, that you think the policymakers should consider in using the oil revenues to develop the country, you know? What do, you don't have to, to go into detail, but what, are, what, what do you think? What could be done? Uh, because the money will be there, and the oil money will continue to be there, but right. how would it be used? Right. Uh, thank you, Akol. Uh, this, uh, this, this is not an easy question. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I have all the answers for it. I will try you know, to give you what I know and what I have seen. Mm -hmm. And uh, my experience, especially with the, you know, with, with, with the oil that South Sudan has, obviously it is, it is a wealth that very few countries have, all right? And it starts from uh, the idea of being able to manage your own wealth. I don't think we can competently say at this point, you know, that we are the ones managing that oil, that we are the ones managing that source. It is be being managed for us. By right? others. By others. And what get to us, to some degree, is something that we can have control over. But uh, because we got out of Sudan and became a very weak nation state, like soon after that, our hands are tied. At this point, we cannot make a decision of kind of stopping that pipeline so that we can come up with another one that will infuriate Sudan, all right? And they could do anything. They, they, we, we, we could really, I, I don't think we have a chance of standing what they are, you know, what they will try to do. We tried that in 2012 when we closed it down, all right? We closed the pipeline down and we were thinking that we will be okay for the next 12 months. It became terrible within three months. And, you know, our situation has changed as a country. 
you know, in the past, you know, with the rebellion and all that, we were able to kind of sustain this because the good days were ahead. Mm -hmm. And when you become a country, it is better hard to tell anyone to say, you know, go to office, go and do your job. You know, the next thing they will, you know, I, I need to go back to my family in the evening, what would I give them? And so in a sense, you, you, you got to create incentives. And so that is one, you know, we, we, we uh, I don't think we have control of it, you know, because the people who are managing it, God knows who they are. I don't think I do. Uh, the second part of it, where I think we can benefit from this, is uh, matching skills, especially people with the right skills, ought to be given assignment of what to do. We have a lot of people who are competent. I don't think they are in the right places. All right, we have some very sophisticated engineers, you know, the water engineers, the mechanical engineers, you, you, geoscientists and all this. They should be the ones, you know, at all these points, you know, on the pipeline, kind of monitoring, you know, and making sure, you know, that they are measuring and that they have, uh, they have the responsibility, you know, on behalf of their country to, uh, to, to, to make sure that oil benefits, you know, they, the country and the, and the citizens. I don't think we have that. You know, we are not doing that. We have the skill for it. You know, we, we usually, you know, we, we, we have a lot of expatriate people who have come to U.S. and have gone to different countries and are back home. But then, instead of that skill being tapped into, all right, they are being allowed to sit idle. All right, that's the second part of it. You know, and uh, the third part is the political instability occur. Mm -hmm. uh, as much as you and I know, we we became, you know, a, a disaster as soon as we, you know, we, we became a country. And until we can fix the politics, it will be better hard for us to say, all right, we have a country that we call our own right now. Let's manage the affairs. And until we can take the conflict out of that, I just, I just don't see how we benefit from it. I, I think we have, we have started on wrong footing. Thank you. I think we are low on time. We are probably less than two minutes, but, <clears throat> but I, 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 I think that we will continue with this conversation another time because there is more to it. Uh, as, as I'm thinking, there is even the way the oil is drilled, right. it leaves a lot of pollutions. Villages that were once villages, lands that were once farmlands right. are no longer usable. And to what degree would the cleanup happen in order for those places to be reverted into what they were used for? Uh, those are questions that we have. And again, as, as you explore your PhD dissertation, it would be interesting to see uh, what you get into. So say your last words uh, before we wrap up the show to continue another time. <laughs> uh, again, thank you, Carl, and to my fellow Vermonters. Uh, thank you for taking care of us. We came to this state as refugees, and in the process, I feel like we have found our footing. Mm -hmm. And this goes to the kind of, you know, to the kind of foundation we, we were given. And so I, I really appreciate everyone. We are very thankful to the state of Oman, to the resident, and to the city of Burlington, South Burlington, and Winniski. I don't think we have ever gotten out of this circle since we came here. She didn't count it, no. She didn't never. count it, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I, I am very excited to be back. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Megan, and thank you so much, uh, uh, Channel uh, Town TV, for hosting us tonight. Chenkwaj uh, Mabil is here in Burman for a while, and so we will have another opportunity uh, to interview him on some of the issues that we have not covered tonight. So we will end the show right there. And thank you so much. Uh, we'll continue with conversation another time. Exactly. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Carl. Bye.